How would you like a 15% discount to my daily email, the stack of stuff, the show notes, discounts to the conference, all of that? All you need to do is text the word SHOW to 33777. You'll get the annual subscription with a 15% discount to my daily email. You'll get the stack of stuff, the links to the show notes, discounts to the conference, and so much more. All you have to do is text the word SHOW, S-H-O-W, to 33777. Text SHOW to 33777. Welcome to the Eric Erickson Show podcast, Hour 3. My fellow Americans, how are you? I hope you're enjoying the show. The phone number is 877-973-7425, should you wish to be on the program. I want to make a small programming note. I am going to be here next week, and I am working on the Good Friday show, um, lining everything up for the Good Friday show, because Good Friday is next Friday. Um, so just randomly, um, the very first year I worked in radio, they told me, I I told them if I had to work on good Friday, I was going to do a good Friday show. They had no idea what that meant. Then they heard it. They're like, you're never going to do that again until the audience demanded it. And now it's kind of a thing uh, that the audience expects and they would burn down the everything if I didn't do it. So now I'm stuck doing it, but that's okay. I I don't mind doing it, but I'm. I, now, I, I used to just do it for three hours, and now I've been interviewing uh, people. I've done Tim Keller, Ligon Duncan, Al Moeller, and others in the past. Um, so I'm, I'm interviewing some people, some surprises. So I'll do that next Friday. And then, y'all, it's so, I don't know how I got this old, but my oldest kid is going to start college in August. So after next week, I'm going to be gone for a week on spring break, the last spring break we have as a family before my kid goes off to college. And it is wild to to be at this point. It really is weird to me that I'm going to have a kid. I don't feel that old. I don't. And then, you know, like I, I cleaned out the garage on Sunday and I went to the gym yesterday. It's like, why do my hands hurt? It's like, oh, it's from all the stuff I was dealing with cleaning out the garage. I'm at that age now where, where everything hurts. It's just, it's getting old sucks. You know, <laughs> being middle age is just not, not you. So the nice thing about being in, in middle age is that I have all the money that I didn't have in my twenties and can still stay out drinking with my friends and, and actually drink better stuff and, and take better trips to Las Vegas. Uh, instead of staying at like the, the dive roach motel, I can actually stay at the nice place and have fun. The, the, the income stream is good. But the, the you wake up the next day and your miserable stuff kind of sucks. And then you go to the gym and you're sore for five days after just looking at a, at a dumbbell. I just miserable. But nonetheless, um, I'm ready to, to go on spring break. I, I could use like a real week off. Um, but I digress. We got stuff we got to talk about. Um, and if you're on the phones, I, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to come to you. I'm not going to ramble long, but I, I really want to talk about something real quick. I can't play you the audio. Libs of TikTok put up this TikTok yesterday of a girl who now calls herself Max and she lives in a car and she got called from Universal to go work at Universal and she was furious about it because she says they dead named her because she's decided she's trans and has a partner and lives in the car with her partner and her dog and she now goes by Max. And the gist of it is this girl who now goes by Max, who referred to her old name as her dead name, not, not didn't, didn't say what her real name was, just her dead name. That's what they call it when your name is Samantha, but you decide you're a boy and want to go by Max. If you call her Samantha, you're dead naming her. I don't know what her real name was. Crazy chick. And she's upset and she's yelling. And I can't play you the audio because literally every other word is the F word. And it would be like you're listening to Morris code. Beep, 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 beep. I mean, it was it was that bad. The effing this, that, F, B, F, F, blah, blah, blah. Oh my gosh, it was awful. Her language. And her her grievances were one that when Universal called and offered her work after nine weeks of not offering her work and wanted her to work on a Saturday, they dead named her. And two 
They only want to pay her minimum wage. And I don't know what her minimum wage is. But she said she wasn't going to go work at a place that only paid minimum wage because minimum wage was not enough to make ends meet, to pay bills and pay rent. So her solution is to be homeless and live in her car and to complain about not being able to shower because she lives in her car, as opposed to, oh, I don't know, working harder and getting multiple jobs like so many people in America are having to do in Joe Biden's economy. The left, by spending so much time focusing on minimum wage and how minimum wage should should, uh, be a living wage that you can cover all of your expenses, has missed the whole point. You know what the minimum wage was always for? High school kids. Getting their start. They didn't need a lot of money. They lived at home with their parents. It is the left, the left that convinced people they should be able to live off minimum wage. Most people, you get a job in high school, you start making minimum wage, you get out of high school, by then you're making above minimum wage. You go to college, you get a college degree, you get out of college, you're making even more than minimum wage. In fact, the people who go to college tend to do the best in life. Still, there is a movement on the right to disincentivize kids going to college, and my gosh, am I sympathetic to it, given the woke nonsense that you encounter regularly in colleges these days, Who can blame you for saying, kid, go be a plumber instead? But here is the fact. This is the fact. This is the truth that kids who go to college and get a college degree have greater long-term earnings potential than any other group of Americans. Not only that, they're more likely to get married. Not only that, they're more likely to have kids. You want grandparents? You want to be grandparents? You want grandkids? Get your kid to go to college and get a good degree. You don't have to go to Harvard. You don't have to go to the Ivy League. You can go to state school. Get a college degree at state school. By the way, my daughter got admitted to the University of Georgia yesterday. Just proud dad moment. My kid got admitted to UGA. She's not going there, but she got admitted. She's going to my alma mater because she wants to go to its engineering school. She wants to be close to home. Merce University. I'm hoping she gets more scholarships because it's pricey. But this entitlement mentality, when you weave the entitlement mentality with the mental illness issue, I mean, this this girl has clearly got mental health issues related to her identity as a transgender person, in addition to her tirade, and in addition to her entitlement mentality, that she should be able to, to have a, a, a chicken in a pot, everything else, and, and what have you. Um, it, it's, it's absolutely insane that this girl has that level of an entitlement mentality that she would rather not work than work minimum wage because she can't get ahead on minimum wage, so why bother? As opposed to go work minimum wage and get some experience and then get ahead. This is not a commercial. I, I, I promise you, it's not a commercial, but I want to mention Old Glory Bank because, you know, I use them, I have my kids' accounts with them, had a guy reach out yesterday about his kids, and it's like, the reason I like them is because no fee checking, you can put your money there. And my kids, as high school kids, my kids don't actually have jobs. And I realize they are very, and I will use the word privilege, even though I hate to use it. But my commitment to my kids was the same one my parents made. Now, I make way more money than my parents made uh, when I was growing up. But my parents, their view was my job was get really good grades, get a good scholarship to go to college. And I worked my butt off in high school, and I got the biggest academic scholarship anyone in my high school had ever gotten. And I still had to take out student loans to pay for college, but not much. I had to take them out for law school, and I'm still paying on those. That's another subject entirely. But my job as a student was to be a student, and that's the way I've done it with my kids. But they've done odd jobs. They've done odd jobs around the house. They've done odd jobs for other people. They've made money. They parked their money in their bank account. Since it's all glory, they're not getting charged fees. And in the process of that, they're building up some capital of their own, but also they're getting experience. Even though it's it's, it's remedial work experience, my, my daughter has done a lot of volunteer work. She's worked at animal shelter. She created a, a job with, with a, a dear friend of mine from college who's in engineering. My kid's engin- interested in engineering. And so my friend from college took my daughter with her when she went to meet with engineers so my kid could talk about this sort of stuff and kind of build it as, as, as kind of a, a work project that she did. And she's getting experience along the way. Now, I personally have to think that if this girl, Max, is living in a car with a partner and a dog, 
She's got troubled home life as well, which contributes to all the mental instability and, and all these other issues. There's clearly more going on there as there is for so many people who live this way. But there's also a generalized mindset in kids of that generation, and I encounter it sometimes with my kids. i got to beat it out of them, metaphorically speaking, that life is not fair. Life is hard. It sucks. You live it and then you die. And if you can start early and minimize your debt acquisition, hello, Dave Ramsey, you can live a better, more fruitful life. I myself struggle with debt. I'm I'm not great at the budgeting, and we're still working through it. And good Lord, the Dave Ramsey people, they check in on occasion to see how I'm doing with the Ramsey plan. And we keep saying we're starting it, and we've kept putting it off for life's events, but we're working on the budget and paying down debts and getting rid of credit card debt and not taking on new car loans and, and not taking out new credit cards and things like that. It's not easy, particularly when you get to my age and you've had your spending habits for so long. Don't start them, but also stop being so entitled, kids. Stop being entitled. You're not entitled to anything in life. You are not entitled to a roof over your head, despite what the left says. You are not entitled to a job. You are not entitled to your salary demands. You are not entitled. You work and you make a good impression. You show up early. You stay late, whether they pay you or not. You show up early. You stay late. You make a good impression. You get recognized. You get ahead. You get job security. I have friends who take issue with me saying stay, show up early and stay late if they're not going to pay you. In California, you know, you can't do that because your company will be punished. But you do everything you can to show them you are invested in the job and you work hard and you get ahead. And then when the job market opens up and becomes competitive, you do a nice resume, you show you've worked hard and you jump. And you work your way up. My first job was at a law firm, and you would think as a law firm and a lawyer, I could make a lot of I was not making a lot of money. In fact, we could barely make ends meet. I had to, one of the reasons I'm still paying on my student loans is I had to defer them for so long when we were first starting out. But over time, I got a little more money, a little more money, a little more money, and after five years, I jumped to a job where I was making more than my wife and I had been making combined when I was a lawyer. And ultimately, she was able to, to leave her job. But I will tell you, in our experience, we had kids, and there were really months where we're like, do we buy formula or do we just not eat because we got to pay the light bill. We can't not pay the light bill, so we're just going to live on beans and rice, and it was hard. We had to make a lot of tough decisions. We had to give up things we wanted, which now at this life existence, it's, it's harder for me to give up some of these things that I want because we sacrifice so much as when we were young and having kids, and people don't want to sacrifice. They, they just think they're entitled to everything. Life is hard. Life is not fair. Life can sometimes suck. And you choose your destiny by how hard you want to work and your commitment to work and your work ethic. And when you're getting on TikTok and you're whining that you're not going to work because you refuse to make minimum wage, well, guess what? You're going to keep living in your car and you're going to blame everyone else and blame capitalism and blame the system and blame the economy. And really, at the end of the day, it's your fault because you're the one with the entitlement mentality. You're the one causing your own problems. No one else. Hello and welcome. It is Eric Erickson. Welcome back to the show. I'm going to go to the phones, waiting very patiently in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, listening on KRMG. Matthew, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm great. What's going on? So I had a question about the um, when you asked earlier about how when presidents should be, you know, when Trump's had his rhetoric about, you know, say like when you shouldn't go out to vote because it's going to be um, you know, it's going to be rigged and everything else. Why does that specifically fall on the candidate and not the voter themselves? <laughs> my, my personal theory is because people are stupid and they believe what candidates tell them, whether or not they should. Um, when, when your guy tells you the election's going to be stolen, you tend to believe it, whether it's true or not, because you find him the most credible person in the room. Same with the Democrats, by the way, though. When Joe Biden tells people that, uh, Donald Trump's going to be a dictator, um, and they believe him. I mean, people are stupid, and and they should restrain the rhetoric on that. It, it, it it's yes, it falls on the people ultimately because they're the ones who don't show up. Like for example, there's a great point on this one, Matthew. Um, so the Democrats in Florida decided to cancel the Democratic primary last night because they didn't want anyone challenging Joe Biden, so they canceled the Democratic primary. The problem is that but municipal elections. That, go ahead. Wouldn't that specifically be illegal? 
if they were to cancel a primary. No, 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 election. Um, no, because um, the the, uh, the parties control the primaries, and so a party mm. can cancel a primary if it wants to. Uh, and the Democrats in Florida chose to because they didn't want anyone to challenge Biden, so they declared him their guy, canceled their primary, legal under Florida law. But the municipal general elections are at the same time. So the, all the races for city and county commission and our city and city council in Florida are during the primary. So Democrats, since they canceled the Democratic primary, did not show up for the general elections for cities last night. And all across Florida, Republicans were swept into office in strong Democratic areas of the state because the Democrats – canceled their primary, and so Democrats thought, well, we don't have a primary. There's no reason to go vote, never mind that you had city council race. So like in Clearwater, Florida, Republicans swept into office uh, where where they've tended to have Democrats in office along the panhandle. A lot of Republicans took over Democratic seats because the the idiocy of the Florida Democratic Party. Uh, so, yeah, you know, Matthew, you're right that ultimately it falls on the people. The people – themselves are responsible. Uh, if you don't want to go vote, if you are deluded into thinking you shouldn't go vote, it, it's your problem. Like, I don't have a problem with the dirty tricksters who they send the they send out the mail piece and say, hey, the elections move to next Tuesday. Well, every sane person knows under the Constitution, the elections in the United States in November are the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November in the Constitution. You can't change it. And so if you're dumb enough to fall for the mail piece and actually we moved it to Wednesday, well, you're an idiot. And they took advantage of you being an idiot. And that shouldn't be punishable by law. In fact, uh, there was a case of a guy who was prosecuted for this and found guilty and, and his conviction was thrown out because it was a freedom of speech issue. And yes, it is a freedom of speech issue. Uh, people at the end of the day are voters and voters are stupid. And that matters greatly. So um, there you have it. Uh, ultimately, yes, it's it's the people now. People sometimes believe what the candidates say, and they sometimes believe what the campaigns say, and they sometimes believe what the press says, and that's why it's so great that Americans for Prosperity brought, bought Bidenomics.com because the Democrats wrapped Joe Biden in the label. He used the phrase Bidenomics on the White House website, and they never bought the domain, the idiots. Campaign malpractice, just like Florida canceling the Democratic primary, campaign malpractice. But the Democrats are doing a lot of campaign malpractice, and AFP took advantage of it. If you go to Bidenomics.com, you get the actual record about Joe Biden's economy. You get the actual record about inflation. You get the actual record about jobs lost and jobs gained and jobs not coming back and how many people are working part-time jobs to account for full-time jobs. You get the actual record at Bidenomics.com. Americans for Prosperity has done a solid for you because not only is the site easy to navigate and easy to understand, but it's easy to share with your friends and family. If you got anybody in your family who thinks the economy is doing well, well, share Bidenomics.com with them. And you should sign up with Americans for Prosperity and be an activist. It's what they do around the country. They're a do tank, not a think tank. They do the business of the conservative movement at americansforprosperity.org. But they really want me to tell you about Bidenomics.com, and it's worth telling you about Bidenomics.com, brought to you by Americans for Prosperity. Welcome back. The phone number is 877-973-7425. Should you wish to be on the program, I am happy to have you. Let me see if I can get through these callers who have been waiting for a little while here. Greg, you're up next. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Um, I was calling because of a growing fear that I have with all these Republicans, like just for whatever reason, they're deciding they're just going to take their toys and go home and not even finish out their term. Mm -hmm. That through attrition, they're going to hand the Democrats back the House even before the election. And then, I mean, then God knows if they get the House back, what they're going to hoist upon us between now and Election Day, what they're going to try to shove down our throat. And it just seems like these Republicans are thinking more about themselves than the country by just saying, I don't like this guy, I don't like this policy, I don't like this bill, so I'm just going to quit and not even finish out the term, even though, what is it, down to like two now they have the majority? So, uh, okay, so it is, it's down to, it's a two-seat margin, but um, that's kind of the bottom. So there are going to be some special elections in the next couple of months, uh, and that will rebound the GOP. They're expected to win. Uh, so that'll bring them back up to about a four or five seat margin, which is where they started. But there is a real fear among House Republicans I've talked to that they could be wiped out before the election if people keep quitting. Uh, Ken Buck being the latest, he's out at the end of this week. 
Um, you, Kevin McCarthy stepping aside. They ousted George Santos. You'll note the Democrats never did the same with Menendez in the Senate. Uh, yeah, the uh, Democrats, hey, actually, well, a couple of them at the beginning of, of the term said, you know, we could take this back before the election. Well, they might. Well, on the special elections, um, shouldn't there be a law that, I mean, if, say, a member quits and you got to go a month, say, before a special election, shouldn't the people in that district uh, get a break on taxes during that month so they're not taxed without I wish. I wish, but that's not how the Constitution works. I, I wish it did work that way because remember, though, you still have some, you still got people in the Senate for you. Um, but yeah, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> um, but and you know as well. So the so the Senate, uh, the way the Senate works is that the governors appoint a replacement if there's a vacancy until an election, and in the House, uh, there's no ability to re- appoint a replacement. So you have to wait until a governor calls a special election. And in a Democratic state, uh, in a Republican replacement, they can put the vacancy well off into the future to drag it out to hope the Democrats make up more ground. It's it's a problem. All right, Travis, thanks for being patient. Welcome to the show. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Great. What's going on? Uh, you spoke yesterday regarding the non-governmental organizations, the NGOs that are yes. organizing this illegal alien Yep. Um, who are these people? Who who are these organizations? Who runs them, and how are they funded? Oh, uh, so there are a lot of organizations, uh, charitable organizations. Some of them are tied to the United Nations. Some of them are global relief agencies, like the Clinton Foundation, started by President Clinton. Uh, you've got. Uh, are, are some of them run by churches, church groups? Yes, there are. There are some are church groups. Um, so, for example, Catholic um, there, charities. Yeah, there's a Catholic charity is one. Uh, the Southern Baptists have their. Um, th- they've got their mission organization, the North American yeah, Mission the, Board, the, and the International the Mission Board. Migration Ministries. Um, there, there are some, what is it? Is it, uh, I can't remember the name of it now the the Southern Baptist ones, they, so I, I, I'm not it, looping, lumping them into some of the, these foreign NGOs that are bringing people in the Southern Baptists are, aren't doing that. So I want to be careful there. I don't want to get the hate mail, but yeah, there are some uh, global evangelical organizations. Our DHS secretary, cabinet official, Alejandro Mayopas, didn't he work for one or he was a board member? He was a board member of a, um, oh, what was the name of it? It was an immigration board. Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. Yeah, 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 yes, 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 yes. Um, which is an, which is actually a fascinating one because that organization goes back to the First World War, evacuating Jews from parts of Europe and then went into overdrive during World War II getting Jews out. Well, now at this point, um, it, it works as an international organization on refugee resettlement around the world. Uh, and there not just a, a, rescuing Jews. There was a woman named Ann Corcoran that ran a website called Refugee Resettlement Watch mm-hmm. that details all these organizations. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and how, and they're look, funded, how they're how they're funded. There are a lot of them, and, and a lot of them they get money from uh, the left wing donor interest groups, the Tides Foundation, and the like. Uh, and I really, again, this is, this is my personal conspiracy theory and I label it a conspiracy theory in advance. It is my personal belief that the Democrats, they see what's happening with the electoral college under the constitution, everyone legal and illegal is counted for the census. And the census is how you shape the electoral college. So you get these people in. They make their way to New York and Illinois and California, states that are starting to lose the Electoral College numbers, Democratic states. And then, well, they can't actually vote, but their numbers boost the Electoral College numbers of the Democratic states, and that helps them. And in 2030, you're going to have another another census. I that, that is my personal theory. And, of course, we should take the Democrats at their words as well that uh, it's about picking crops and they know that um, they need cheap labor to pick the crops. And so they're turning a blind eye to illegal immigrants. It really is stunning to me to hear Democrats more and more be so open about uh, crops and that we need what they call undocumented immigrants, that is illegal immigrants, to work for below minimum wage to pick the crops. Now, if they could unionize them all, you and I both know they darn well would jack up the the wage that they're being paid. But 
They're not going to unionize them because they're illegal aliens, and they're going to allow them to be corrupt. Here's a reality, though. There is a way to do this, and until the 1960s and Lyndon Johnson, there was a migrant labor law in the United States that allowed unskilled laborers to come seasonally across the border to work partner directly with farms and farmers. They could send a lot of their money home, and uh, then they could go back at the end of harvest season, and they didn't have to be paid the American minimum wage. They could keep things low. But the unions decided it displaced union workers, and they killed the program. It's everything the Democrats wanted, uh, but it was a government program that allowed the legal migration and then incentivized them leaving the country because if they didn't leave, they couldn't work the next year, so they had to go home. And, well, the Democrats, of course, killed the program on behalf of the unions. There are lots of lessons in this for all of us. Uh, the immigration issue. Now, I want to I, I want to turn my attention to something else because I think this needs to be said. I was thinking about this the other day, and it's worth thinking about again. George W. Bush, the Trump Republican Party has kind of um, made George Bush an anathema to the GOP, a pariah. They've moved on beyond the Bushes. They blame George Bush for the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, never-ending wars, the neocons and all of that. I was thinking about this in regards to PEPFAR yesterday, that uh, some conservatives now want to kill PEPFAR because Biden and the Democrats like it. In the year 2000, an extraordinary number of evangelicals decided not to vote. It's a stewardship issue, the right to vote. For Christians, it's a stewardship issue, and you you vote to steward the country, or you decide that in a matter of stewardship, you're collectively not going to go vote because you don't think that either party has candidates worthy of a Christian character, so you sit home. And your numbers by all of you sitting home is a matter of good stewardship because the campaign's notice, and the proof of this is 2000, when so many evangelicals decided they weren't going to go vote, Carl Rove, when Bush got elected with 539 votes in Florida in the Electoral College, decided they needed to do something to get Christian votes. And so they pushed for adoption reform and uh, incentives for adoption and tax credits and tax deductions for adoption and PEPFAR, which is the presidential emergency program for um, AIDS relief in Africa. And um, it has worked stunningly well. And it was done through Bush's faith beliefs. And it has been just a great program. George Bush's initiative have say, has saved millions of lives. He should get the Nobel Prize. But, you know, that's not it. And that's not just it. George Bush also, in 2005, after his reelection, wanted to privatize Social Security. And the way it would have worked is people under 40 would have been steered into a program. People 40 to 50 would have been split between the new program and the old program. People 50 and above would have no effect whatsoever. And for those of you worried about what if the stock market crashes, well, the way the program would have been designed is that as you got older and older, more and more of your stock in your portfolio would have transitioned to bonds that paid a stable amount of money that weren't risky and weren't going to collapse. So by the time you went to retirement, you would have a whole lot of money. In fact, people who are reaching retirement age right now who would have benefited from Bush's plan would have been paid a lot more Social Security than they're getting from the current Social Security plan. Had America listened to George Bush in 2005, every American would be financially better off. It's just a fact. But you know what else I forgot about Bush? One of the other things Bush wanted to do was he wanted to simplify taxes. He knew he didn't have the votes for a flat tax. So one of Bush's proposals, and you're all filing taxes right now, you're going through this. You know, you get a W-2 from your uh, employer, When you make a wage, if you get independent contractor money, you get a 1099. If you get dividends, you get a 1099 DIV. All of these are required to be filed with the federal government. So Bush's plan was very simple. Everybody's got to file their 1099s and their W-2s with the government in addition to sending them to the taxpayer. So the IRS would collect your W-2s and your 1099s, tracking your Social Security number. They'd send you a letter in the mail saying, here is what we have for you on file from all the documents disclosed. 
So therefore, we think you either get this refund because you paid this much in taxes so far, or here's what you owe us. If you dispute this, you can file your taxes. If you agree to it, send us a check or we'll send you the refund. Let us know. You So you would never have had to go to your local H&R Block or never had to use TurboTax. And that's the problem. The corporations of America that exist because of the tax code killed Bush's idea and said, we will offer free tax software. We'll do it. Well, it's really hard to find that free software and it doesn't work very well. The country would have been better off had we listen, listened to Bush with Social Security. The country would have been better off had we listened to Bush with uh, how to pay taxes. He was well ahead of his time and had good sound proposals that now even Democrats acknowledge were good at the time, but they wanted to vilify him so much at the time the Democrats did. And now, sadly, a lot of Republicans do for some absurd reasons. Yes, there are people who got tired of war and things like that, but Bush was actually a pretty good president of the United States and his domestic plans. Now, listen, I disagreed with him on expanding Medicare Part D. I disagreed with him on No Child Left Behind, terrible piece of legislation. But you know, when it came to how to pay your taxes and your Social Security and then PEPFAR, America should have listened to the man. His legacy is complex, but had a lot of good stuff that Republicans should probably get back to. And Democrats who vilified it then are now begging the country to do what Bush wanted then because it would save everyone so much money and make it so much easier to pay taxes. It's just fascinating how over time history changes their opinions on people. And you look at PEPFAR and how many... People have been saved in Africa. It was such a wonderful, good program. It's sad to see Republicans turn on it just because Joe Biden wanted to renew it. But goodness, Bush, he is a good man. He made a good president, too. Now, I got to tell you about Old Glory Bank. I mentioned it earlier um, with my kids and getting accounts there. Y'all, it's no fee checking, no fee savings, and they've got a banking bill of rights you can see at oldglorybank.com. Why a banking bill of rights? Because increasingly, Banks are listening to the wokes, and credit unions are too, and so they're restricting uh, what you can use your money for in the bank account because of politics. It's sad to see. So Old Glory wants you to know that they're not going to charge you fees on your checking your savings account. They're not going to give your information to the federal government. They're not going to prohibit you from doing business with those you wish to do business with, and they're not going to cancel your bank account because of who you are and what your politics are. OldGloryBank.com, you can see their banking bill of rights. They're a great bank. They're my bank. No fee checking, no fee savings. You can do mortgages with them, FHA, conventional, um, however you need it. They are a real bank. You can have a real relationship with a real banker at Old Glory Bank. Even though they're online and headquartered in Oklahoma, you can take cash to 85,000 retail locations around the country and deposit it into your checking accounts. They've made it so easy to do. That's why I got my, my kids their accounts because – They can take cash from babysitter or whatnot, uh, go to a local retail location near our house, deposit it, and it goes into their bank account. They make it so easy. Old Glory Bank, very innovative, very good people, great conservatives. OldGloryBank.com, you can get an account in less than eight minutes online. OldGloryBank.com, member FDIC, equal housing lender, terms and conditions apply. I got all the legal language out of the way, but I'm telling you, Old Glory Bank, my bank, I love them, you will too. Greetings, conversationalists. Welcome. It is Eric Erickson here. I wish to talk about the Trump lawsuit. I think there is a due process issue for Donald Trump in his case in New York. You know, he wants to appeal uh, Judge Er, whatever, uh, 400-some-odd-million-dollar case. It's a garbage case. It really is. Uh, Arms-length transactions. Uh, All around, everyone got to do their own due diligence, and yet uh, Trump was found guilty. Clearly, the judge is a progressive. The the, uh, attorney general wanted him. Now they've got this massive judgment, and Trump can't come up with a bond. One of the reasons he can't come up with a bond, and it's kind of funny this comes up because I was talking the other day to someone who actually is involved on the bond side of things, and the amount of money is too big for insurance companies and bond companies. They, they just simply is impossible to get a bond for that much money. Uh, there's one or two uh, companies in the world that can do it. Uh, one of them won't do it because of the political angle, and, and the other struggle because you have insurance issues. All If Donald Trump can't appeal because insurance and bond companies won't give you money, that's a due process violation because it's not on him, it's on them. 
He's got the right to an appeal. This becomes a constitutional issue. And it's very notable to me that people on the left who scream about due process and fairness of the court systems have abandoned all of that because it's Donald Trump. They want defendants to get every right and benefit of the doubt except for Donald Trump. They want defendants to have rights to a fair trial except for Donald Trump. They will, they're perfectly fine with the randomization of judges to cases unless one of those judges happens to be someone they perceive to be pro-Trump. They don't like that. Every single thing that the left claims they want in the justice system, Donald Trump has gotten an advantage of, and they hate every one of them because it's Donald Trump. And this, his inability to appeal because of his inability to find the money to cover a bond with outside companies who are struggling with the amount interferes with his right to appeal, it is a due process violation. You cannot restrain the man's right to appeal a judgment uh, because due process requires a right to an appeal, and you have constrained his right. And I really do think if push comes to shove, he needs to challenge the New York law that says he's got to put up all this money in order to be able to appeal because he's attempted to do it but he can't get the bond, and that's not his fault. It's the outside company's fault. And the New York Court of Appeals would be wise to take that into consideration lest their entire system of bonds for appeals be found unconstitutional. I am not a Trump fan. Y'all all know I'm not a Trump fan. I absolutely think this is a scam case designed to persecute him. I absolutely do. Because these sorts of things happen all the time. And even the Associated Press, not me, not the Trump-friendly press, but the Associated Press found they can find no record of any case based on these statutes in New York going this way for these amounts of money and seeing assets taken, even when the situation was much more severe. That's the Associated Press. That's not me. The Associated Press cannot find that the attorney general and the judges in New York treated anyone else this way. It's uniquely about Donald Trump, and frankly, the reaction of those who get mad when I point out this is a scam case is uniquely about Donald Trump. They don't like him, and so screw him in their mind, as opposed to give him what every other defendant should get. And he's gotten something far worse than any defendant has ever gotten for far less. No one was taken advantage of in this case, and he deserves due process.